What is the easiest way to walk through these? All right. Do you want to go by warmth? Do you want to go by like, do you want to go like, how do you want to do this? Because there's a lot to cover. Yeah. So let's do by time. So what I want to do is actually want to do the first 10 seconds of your, your video, the first minute of your video that actually helps us break it down. Cause actually the first 10 seconds are really important. The first 10 seconds of you being on camera. Really? So, yeah. Because, um, it sets you up for the rest of the time. So if you can nail your first 10 seconds, it makes the next hour easier. Wow. That, what, so, so what do we have to do? Okay. What are we doing? So, so, so you're about to tell us yes. in the first 10 seconds yes. of a Zoom meeting, you yes. must do this in order to be influential. What do you do? Okay. First 10 seconds. And you, I want you to code this if you did this on your last video. So here's what you should do. And here's what you should code. Number one, in the first second, you should try to show your hands. I know this sounds really weird, but they what? use eye tracking studies and they found that one of the first places the brain looks when they're trying to gauge someone's warmth is hands. Why? This is actually a survival mechanism. Back in our caveman days, if we were approached by a stranger caveman, we wanted to see if they were carrying a rock or a spear, right? So this still remains. Something interesting happens. I'll do a little experiment for you. So if you're watching the video, um, I'm going to hide my hands. If you're listening, I'm hiding my hands right now. Yeah. The moment you can't see someone's hands. So if I were to give this entire interview with my hands behind my back, something interesting would happen in your brain and Mel's brain, which is that your amygdala would begin to activate. And that's because when you can't see someone's hands, you wonder, what, what is she holding? What, mm. What's her intention? And so the longer I keep my hands behind my back, the more distracted you should become with the fact yes. that my hands are behind my back. You, you want them to come back out, right? Yes. Okay, they're back, right? Okay, there and they are. Oh, Hello. So much better. So this is a survival mechanism. The moment you hop on video, walk on stage, walk into a boardroom. Like walk put your hands date. up like, hey, everybody. Hey, good morning. Nice to okay. see you. Okay, so the Easy. first 10 seconds, we turn on the cameras coming on. We put the hands up. Hi, yeah. everybody. Or just one, right? Like a little okay. wave. Nice to see you. You're, you walk into a crowded restaurant to see your date. Hey, good to see you. That hand gesture immediately deactivates their fear processing. Easy. Okay. So I want them visible. Second little bonus tip here is the space, the distance. And I literally want you to measure this. The distance between your nose and the camera. The reason for this is because in person, we are very aware of what's called proxemic zones. Proxemic zones are the space between people. So we know, and this is a little bit different culture to culture. So hand gestures universally, we like to see hands, but culture to culture, we also like to know how, what's the distance between people. So I highly recommend, make sure your camera is at least a foot and a half away from your face. Okay. The reason for this is because imagine if I were to give, now I'm going to get really close to the camera. Imagine if I were to give my entire interview really close, you'd be like, <laughs> Vanessa, back up, back up. Oh right? my God. I totally like lean into the camera. I, 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 I have no space above my head. I like my whole face right in there. So maybe I got to back off a little bit on the camera. Let's talk about this for a second. Okay. So there are no bad cues in the sense of they're all purposeful. When you are really close, and I, I love your videos. I've seen your close-up videos. You should know on purpose, if you are very close to the camera, right up in your face, you are signaling intimacy. You are Ooh. signaling, I'm right up in it. And that's because as humans, there are four different proxemic zones, the public zone, the social zone, the personal zone, and the intimate zone. We reserve the intimate zone, which is zero to 18 inches away, zero to a foot and a half away for people we feel really close with. So our partners, our parents, so does our best friends. And so actually when I watch your videos where you're really close, I feel like we're besties. Mm. Now tell me, tell me everything. So I would say reserve those videos for your intimate moments. Okay. You're literally signaling that. So in a normal Zoom call, I want you at least a foot and a half away. It also helps you show your hands, right? It helps oh, have those gestures. So Easy. smart. Okay. Easy. So the first 10, the first 10 seconds, everybody, we got the hands up and we got to be about a foot and a half away. Yep. Because this is, si oh, and there's more? Oh, there's more. Okay. There's so much more. Okay, second, vocal. So that was a nonverbal cue. I want you to make sure you are not accidentally using the question inflection on your name or an important information. The question inflection is when we go up at the end of our sentence. So it sounds like we're asking a question. And so often we found in our lab that people would use the question inflection in the first 10 seconds, which made people doubt them. 
So I'm gonna, I want to share this study because this study gave me the chills when I first heard it. And I think it's so incredibly important for people who are listening, who want to be taken seriously. So what they did in this study, I promise I won't get too into the science. Very simply, they brought doctors into their lab and they wanted to know if people would change their perceptions of charisma based on their voice tone. So they asked the doctors to record 10 second voice tone clips. So these clips, they had to say their name, where they worked and their specialty. So it sounded like this. I use my lipstick as an example. Hi, my name is Dr. Edwards. I specialize in oncology and I work at Children's Presbyterian Hospital. They took these clips and they warbled the words. So you could hear the volume, the pace, the cadence, but not the actual words being said. So that sounded like this. Okay. They asked participants to then rate these doctors on warmth and competence. Based on the warbled thing that you just did? Yes. So imagine that I just did that. And then I asked you, do you like this person? Is this person smart? So participants rated these gobbledygook clips on, do they like this person, this person smart? They found the doctors who had the lowest warmth and competence ratings had the highest rate of malpractice lawsuits. What? The doctors with the lowest warmth and competence ratings, simply based on their voice tone, had the highest rate of malpractice lawsuits. This implies that we don't just dislike people based on their skills. We dislike people based on our perception of their skills. And that happens within the first few seconds of hearing them. The biggest wow. pattern, it, it's, it was such a, it's such a shockwave through the community because these are, these are doctors who are very well trained. What they found was patterns. There were certain doctors who across the board were rated as highly charismatic from gobbledygook. And there were certain doctors that over and over again, they were rated as not very smart, not very likable. Here was the biggest pattern, up talk. The doctors who had an introduction like this, hi, my name is Dr. Edwards. I specialize in oncology and I work at Children's Presbyterian Hospital, <laughs> right? What it did is it changes the way that we listen. They found that when we hear the question inflection accidentally used on a statement, our prefrontal cortex shifts from listening to scrutinizing. Mm. We think, why did they just question themselves? I guess I should question them. We hear this all the time in sales calls where someone is killing it in a pitch. This is what, this is the income, the, the last I, or in a salary negotiation. I'd love to work for your company. I, I think this, I'd be a great fit for you. I love your mission. And I'm really looking for a salary range of over a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Oh, everybody, did you hear that question? Yeah. I'm really looking for a salary range of um, $100,000. When you ask your price, you are begging people to negotiate with you. You're telling people, I don't really believe this number and you shouldn't believe it either. So what happens in the first 10 seconds is we're nervous, right? We're really nervous. We've been holding our breath. We're waiting for Zoom call. And so we accidentally give away all of our vocal power in the first 10 seconds. We say, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Vanessa. We'll get started in a few. Whoa. Okay. I just, this is why it's important to tape a Zoom call you're on, everybody. Yeah. Because now you have three research back, incredibly subtle but profound behavior changes that you need to make immediately. Immediately. Hands up. You got to have the right distance, which is a foot to a foot and a half nose to camera. No up talk, everybody. And I, I would imagine that most people don't realize that they do it. No idea. That's why coding is so important. That's why seeing yourself, that's why we don't realize when we walk into a salary negotiation or we walk into a pitch meeting with a client or we go on a date and we think it went well. Right? How often have people been sideswiped and they think, yeah, I think that went great, but I didn't get a call back or I didn't get a second date. It's because you are accidentally telling the world how to treat you. And if you under signal warmth, people don't like you. If you under signal competence, people don't take you seriously. And the up talking everyone oh. is when you're under signaling competence, 
competence. You might be the most competent and and qualified person, but if you walk into that interview and you don't, you know, not sure, like it, my last job was great. I think I'd do great here. I, you know, hundred thousand, that would be, that'd be great. Like it, 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 you just shot yourself in the foot. Yeah. And you don't even realize it because you don't hear it. I bet people do this with dating all the time. All the time. And the problem is it's a, it's a permission seeking behavior. So if we really get down to the root cause of it, which is, which is one thing that fascinates me is this is appeasement body language, right? So this is, do you like me? Do you agree with me? So oftentimes highly warm people who really, really desperately want to be liked use more uptalk because they're asking, do you agree? Do you like me? The crazy thing is, <laughs> so is it annoying. actually the opposite effect, right? So that I also want you to get really to the root cause of if you hear yourself do uptalk. And by the way, please go listen to your voicemail. So go listen to your voicemail or any voice recordings. If you've sent any voice recordings or voice memos in the past few days, go re-listen to them and see if you accidentally use uptalk and go re-record. Go re-record. So how do you coach somebody who has a style of speaking where they naturally end sentences with this uptalk? So it's almost like you've got a statement and, and as you speak it, it sounds like a question at the end. Yes. And do women do this more than men? Yes. So women do this more than men. Also, the research finds that women typically, but not always, are seen as higher in warmth. And that's because from a very young age, women are often taught to be liked. And so they tend to dial up their warmth earlier. Typically, but not always, men are seen as higher in competence. And that's because often men are told to be right. Mm. So we also have to be aware of those gender differences. So yes, women typically more often use um, up talk or high warmth. So luckily, this is actually a very easy thing to fix. So we're going to okay. do it. We're going to do it with breath and pausing. So one of the things that can happen with uptalk is we're nervous and we're speaking very quickly. And so what I want you to think about is what do you want to say with purpose and how can you deliver it with purpose? So there's three kinds of inflection. There's uptalk. So going up at the end of our sentence, there's neutral going up, going, saying neutral at the end of our sentence. And there's the downward inflection, which is very commanding, which is going down at the end of our sentence. Okay. So mm. all three of those things signal something very, very different. What I want you to pay attention to is the tension in your vocal cords. So when we are tense, when we're nervous, we tend to take in a breath and talk at the top of our breath. It's really, really hard to sound confident when we're up here. So what I want you to do is when you say hello or your first few words, I want you to speak on the out breath. Okay. What most people do is they hold their breath before they get on a Zoom call or a phone call. So they go, hello, all the way up here. <laughs> Gosh, you're right. Cause you're like, hi, hi, hi. Oh, so good to see you. <laughs> so we did this experiment where we had people submit recordings of important phone calls and we found the highest part of the entire call up talk and vocal tone was the first 10 seconds. Literally people would go, Hey, it's so good to see you. So how's it going? That's a thousand percent. Right. So this is really easy to fix. What do you and do? Instead of holding your breath, I want you to speak on the out breath. So let's do a little experiment. I want you to hear the highest end of your range. So the highest end of your range is when you speak at the top of your breath. So on the count of three, I want us to say, and wherever you are, if you can do this in your car, tell your kids to do it with you. So I want you to take in a deep breath and say hello at the top of your breath. So it's going to sound like this. One, two, three. Hello. So you want to try it with me, Mel? Yeah, okay. I do. One, two, three. Hello. 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 Yeah. High. That, okay. It's very so high. That's the highest end of your breath. If you hear your range going up there, you are speaking too high. You hear yourself go there. What I want you to do is try to relax your vocal cords by speaking on the out breath. Hello. So this time, there you go. That was it. <laughs> so you just heard the difference. So here's my difference. Ready? Hello. Hello. Those are both me, but they sound totally different. So this time what we're going to do is we're going to take a deep breath in on the count of three. And I want you to say hello on the out breath. I want you to say okay. it in a downward inflection. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Hello. hello. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm. Nice that deep sounded voice. good. Yes. Okay. So signaling competence. Uh, we now have a bunch of things that you can do, including, and probably one of the most important is learning how to take a breath and then talk. 
yes. on the out breath. I, can I add one more competence cue that I think Please. is really easy? Yes. Really easy. Okay. So hand gestures, there's two sides of hand gestures. One is visible, right? So we mentioned having a little, you know, wave, hello, greeting at the, at the top of a video call or in person. The next thing we look for in hand gestures is purpose. What highly competent people did. So we did a research study where we analyzed thousands of hours of Ted talks. Okay. I was curious, why do some Ted talks go viral and some don't? So in our lab, we analyzed thousands of hours counting cues, coding, we literally coded Ted talks and looked at the view count. We found that the most viral Ted talks use an average of 465 gestures in 18 minutes. Whereas the least popular Ted talks use an average of 272 gestures. It's almost half. What happens here is the best Ted talkers, they get on stage and they typically go, good morning. So they have a visible hand out of their pockets right in front. And then what they do, I'm going to demo this for you. Um, and by the way, if you're just listening, I'm going to show some hand gestures along with my words. Mel, see if this looks familiar to you. <clears throat> this is every popular TED Talk. Today, I <laughs> want to talk to you about a big idea. It's going to change your life in three different ways. That is cueing the brain to say, wow. This person knows their content so well, they can speak to me on two tracks. They can speak to me with their verbal, but they can also demo their concepts along with their words. So if I were to say, today I have a really big idea and hold up my hands like I'm holding a penny, you're like, Vanessa, it looks so small. Your brain is more likely to believe my gesture than my word. Wow. Wow. Okay. So let me just say, if you want to watch this, Go to youtube.com slash Mel Robbins. This yes. entire episode, the unabridged version, we put them up there. You can check it out. And it was very interesting because when you said big idea, what she did, everybody, is she held up her fingers, like making that gesture when, like, imagine if I were like, it's really puny. Tiny. And now I'm making that tiny little, like, my fingers are like a quarter inch apart. <laughs> when she said it's a big idea and she showed me the hand signal for puny, Vanessa's dead right. My brain went right to the hand gesture. And I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't match. Why the heck is she saying puny? Like, why is she not saying puny? Because clearly it's a puny idea if she's making it. That's really interesting. So that this is where I think inauthenticity comes from. So people who are inauthentic are saying one thing with their words, but they're nonverbal, their vocal doesn't match. And our brain does not like this. Our brain is like, wait a minute, that was incongruent, right? Like that didn't work. So, and by the way, this is very hard to do. So everyone who's listening, I want to do a little experiment with you. What I want you to do in a second is I want you to say five, but I want you to hold up the number three. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Five. Five. Oh, that's weird. A horrible. My brain literally went, that's the wrong hand gesture, Mel. <laughs> Your brain was like, stop, stop. That is because our brains also like to be congruent. So our brains use our gestures as truth telling. And so what happens is, is there's this really interesting cycle of if you want to be shown up, show up as competent, the other thing you can think about in the first 10 seconds and then throughout is how can you demo a concept with your hands? Now, this is not interpretive dance. I don't want you to like, good morning. I'm so happy to be here. You know, I love you. <laughs> You're hilarious. <laughs> right? We don't want to do that, but there is a difference of, you know, I'm so happy to be here. I want to talk about two different things in the meeting today. When someone holds up two and they say two, not only does it make you look competent, they think, wow, it really is two. You're also hooking the other person's brain to think, I better remember both. Mm. You become more memorable with more purposeful gestures. People believe your competence when your gestures and your words are congruent. A very easy one. Guess what we're talking about today? You and me, baby. We're talking about the it factor. Some people just have it, don't they? And based on the research, when people have the it factor, it means they have charisma. So today, you're going to meet one of the world's leading researchers and experts on charisma and body language, Vanessa Van Edward.